I don't know about you three, but I think I need to start every day with that Beyonce song. <laughs> I feel very energized right now. <laughs> I thought it was been better all. I was just rocking out to it. <laughs> yeah, actually, I'm, I'm glad you stopped it and didn't just turn the video on because uh, you guys want to see me mini dancing. So. <laughs> I'm also guilty of that. <laughs> So just want to, first of all, thank everyone for joining us today. We appreciate you all tuning in for our Family Law Now presentation, celebrating women and inspiring inclusion in the legal community. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge all of the amazing women we have in our audience today. Um, and also happy Women's History Month and International Women's Day that we'll be celebrating tomorrow. Um, and we also appreciate those joining us today who are here in support of women. So I feel very grateful to work with so many strong, intelligent, and inspiring women at our firm, three of which we have the pleasure of hearing from today. I'm honored to be able to be here today to introduce them, but before I do, I'll let you know what they will be sharing over the course of the next hour or so. So they'll be discussing the history of women in the legal field, the current landscape, statistics and trends, gender disparities, leadership and mentorship, women in the workplace, empowering women in the legal profession, intersectionality, recognizing diversity within women, looking ahead, the future of women in law, and then we'll also allow some time for Q&A at the end. So first, I would like to take a moment to introduce our panelists. So first we have Kimberly Painter, who is an associate lawyer at Russell Alexander Collaborative Family Lawyers, practicing in all areas of family law. Since her call to the bar in 2013, she has experienced practicing in the areas, areas of family, criminal, and civil law, as well as wills and estates. Kimberly now practices exclusively in family law, and her objective as a family lawyer is to achieve a resolution as efficiently as possible for her clients, and she strives to do this through negotiations and litigation when necessary. She prides herself on truly listening and understanding her clients and ensuring they feel supported throughout the whole process of their family law matters. And next we have Sonia Riccelli with nearly nine years of experience in family law, including two years as a family law clerk at our firm. Sonia brings a wealth of expertise to her role. She specializes in various aspects of family law, such as case research, document preparation, court proceedings, and client relations. Recently licensed to practice law in Ontario, Sonia now serves as an associate lawyer at our firm, aiming to leverage her legal knowledge to provide exceptional support to clients. Known for her upbeat and optimistic demeanor, Sonia prioritizes building positive and trustworthy relationships with clients to alleviate the stress associated with domestic issues. Next, we have Michelle Mulchin, who is the senior managing lawyer at our firm. She's been practicing family law for over 14 years, specializing in divorce, custody access, property division, child and spousal support, and family responsibility office enforcement matters. Her focus is on creating comprehensive creative resolutions to family law matters, and Michelle excels at helping clients deal with complex financial issues that arise as a result of separation. And just before I pass things over to Michelle, just a couple things to note. Um, so for those of you who are in the legal profession, this program has been accredited by the Law Society of Ontario and contains one hour of EDI professionalism. Um, so that's it from me and I will pass things over to Michelle now. Thanks so much, Shannon. Every year as those numbers go up, I just feel older and older. So maybe we'll have to fudge that. Maybe we'll go back to saying 10 plus years. <laughs> feel better. <laughs> Thanks so much for that wonderful introduction. That was so great. All right, so let's see the results of our poll. There we go. All right, so in, in celebration of International Women's Day, happy almost International Women's Day, everyone. I will be celebrating with some wonderful women tomorrow, and I hope you all get the opportunity to do that as well. Uh, so that's about 20% of us. About 60% of us is a woman in the legal professional and wants uh, sorry, in the legal profession and wants to hear more about it. 29% uh, of us is not a woman, but would like to learn how they can best support the legal community and the women in that community. Bravo, thank you so much, guys. We have someone here who's a leader from an organization and wants to know how they can better support women, someone who's in HR and a couple of others. So thank you so much. It really helps us to understand 
who is in our audience and to tailor a little bit of our conversation towards them. So, so welcome everyone. So I also wanted to say, uh, it is such a pleasure to be here. This is my second year hosting this event and uh, every year we just get more and more people registered and I'm so excited for it. Um, at our team meetings, we usually start with gratitude. So I just want to express my gratitude. Uh, first of all, for the women who came before us and who helped us to be where we are today. Uh, secondly, to these three uh, powerful, strong, amazing women who are with us today. I um, hope I'm not stepping out of line when I say that I consider you all friends on top of being colleagues. So I'm really excited to do this presentation with you today. Sonia, don't cry. I see it. I see it happening. <laughs> and lastly, to all of you who came out today, thank you so much. Just being here and showing up shows that you care and that you're having these uh, issues at the forefront. All right, um, so I think, sorry, Sonia, I think I uh, didn't mean to make you cry. We're gonna start off with you, the history of women in the legal field. Hi everyone, thank you, Michelle. Um, welcome everyone. I will be discussing briefly a history of women in the legal field. Um, I, so I'm just gonna start off by saying most female pioneers in the legal profession focused much of their attention on their career and few of them were married or even had children. And it's because of these pioneers that women, that women today are not only able to work in the legal profession, but are also considered persons. So I'm just gonna briefly um, name drop. Uh, in the early 1890s, Clara Brett Martin petitioned the Law Society of Upper Canada seeking permission to become a law student, which was dismissed. She then raised her case to the Ontario legislature where an MPP heard her case and introduced a bill requiring that the word person in the law society statute also include females as well as males. This time the legal profession was divided between being either a solicitor or a barrister. As a result, Clara had to return to the Ontario legislature to seek permission to be admitted as a barrister. In 1897, following a difficult and lengthy seven-year struggle, Clara Brett Martin became the first woman admitted to practice law in Canada by the Law Society of Upper Canada. However, the issue of women's admissibility to the profession was litigated in New Brunswick, British Columbia, and Quebec in the 20 years immediately after Clara became the first female lawyer in Canada. In fact, many applications for admission to the legal profession by women were actually denied by the courts because women were not considered persons under the British North America Act 1867, which today is the Constitution Act 1867. Eventually, Mabel Penry French, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, uh, successfully achieved admission as a lawyer and became the first woman to practice law in two separate Canadian provinces, New Brunswick in 1907 and British Columbia in 1912. By 1916, Emily Murphy was appointed a magistrate by the Alberta government, the first woman to be appointed to the bench in the British Commonwealth. She also established the Fabulous Five or the Valiant Five, which is a group of consisted of five prominent Canadian women who, in 1927, petitioned the federal constitution to determine if the word person under Section 24 of the British North America Act included female pers persons. And this eventually led to the groundbreaking and leading constitutional decision of the 1929 persons case, declaring that women were considered persons and therefore were qualified persons and eligible to be, appoint, uh, to be appointed to the Senate and established that Canadian constitution should be interpreted in a way that is more consistent with the needs of society, AKA women. That is my brief history. <laughs> Sorry if it was a little boring. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's great. And again, it, it's insane to think that that was just around 100 years ago, right? What? Yeah. How much has changed, even from my grandmother's time? And I know that she would be so proud and so happy to see what, uh, what we've accomplished today. Um, okay, so tell us a little bit about yourselves. 
again, this is just to get an idea of where our audience is, you know, how to tailor our, how to tailor our advice. If we have more younger um, lawyers or people in the profession, then we'll try to tailor our advice to more younger people and issues that relate to them. Um, I, we've tried to make this as broad as possible so everyone gets a little bit out of it, but, you know, it's always nice to know who's in our audience. All right, Shannon, let's see the results of our poll, please. Excellent. So 61% of us identify as a woman, 26% of us identify as a man. That's wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for being here. 26% uh, of us is five years or under as a lawyer, and another 22% of us is 10 years plus as a lawyer. And we have a law student. Welcome to our law students. We're especially um, grateful for you. And, you know, I always say to the law students, whether they're in my firm or another firm, please reach out. My email address is simple, simply michelle at russellalexander.com. Um, I was a student. I, I remember what those days were like, and I remember how difficult it is. All right, so why don't we talk a little bit about uh, the current landscape, statistics and trends. Who do we have up next? That's me. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Michelle. Um, this was, uh, you know, some people might find going through the numbers and the statistics boring. Uh, I actually found it quite interesting, and it's also interesting to see how the trends um, have changed and just sort of what's happening. Um, so, I mean, it's not going to surprise anyone when I say, you know, there's still an increase in the number of female law graduates that we're seeing, which is a great positive shift. Um, we've heard that over the last decade or so that we're just seeing more females in the profession, which is great. Um, but with positives also come some negatives and some challenges. Um, many major law firms have increased the hourly requirements in the last few decades. And this is problematic because the number of hours in a day hasn't increased. And this has created a lot of burnout in the profession. Um, and, you know, we're going to go through that in some of the, the research and the numbers about people leaving the profession. Um, in terms of the statistics, so as of 2020, the Law Society of Ontario's membership reported 44% females and 56% males. Um, so again, you know, numbers that that we expect to see um, a little bit, I mean, females are still under that, but still good progress. Um, in terms of management and leadership roles, so McKinsey uh, did a paper and they focused on women in law firms and part of the research they conducted was women in law firms in North America. So this is looking at both Canadian and US. And it was a large study because it was across the continent and it involved 222 participants. And some of the most interesting findings that I found was they found that women were well represented at the associate level. So when we're looking at junior, mid-level, senior, they account for about 46% of lawyers. And then the picture changes when we're looking at senior level. When we And, and I know this is not gonna be surprising to, to some people, 19% of equity partners were women. Um, and then when we look at women of color, the representation drops significantly at all levels. Uh, the same study did a, a survey. They found 44% of women believe that they can have both when it comes to career success and personal life compared to 60% of men uh, who thought the same thing. Female lawyers stated that prioritizing work-life balance was one of the greatest challenges of their professional success followed by the difficulty in balancing work and family. Um, and that was the reason why 61% said they didn't want to make partner, whereas men uh, rated this as the second reason. Uh, the Law Society of Ontario also produced a paper in 2023, which is very recent. However, I will say some of the stats in it are a little bit, a little bit outdated. Um, Michelle, I know we talked about this before with uh, the pandemic, a lot of research sort of put on hold um, and, you know, it, it would be nice to see now that we're on the other side of it, have a more current stats about this. Um, but this paper stated, and so now we're looking at um, in Ontario, that 7.9% of women lawyers are partners in private practice. And that to me was really shocking. Um, and this is a stat, I will say that's from 2021. It's, it's from the statistical snapshot of lawyers in Ontario, which I'm going to be referencing, but 7.9%, which I was a lot lower than I, I anticipated. Um, 
this, the Law Society of Ontario produced the 2021 statistical snapshot of lawyers, and they looked at ages that women most commonly may have children and be raising young children. And they looked at the percentage of them acting as partners in law firms. In the under 35 age group, we have 1.3% represented by females versus 3% of males under 35. And then if we go into the 35 to 44 age group, we have 7.3 females in law firms as partners versus 12.8% of males. Um, the Law Society in this paper also noted that the numbers are showing that women are more likely than men to lead law firms for employment in government, education, and in-house and outside of law practice. And I know this is a trend we've seen year over year, um, so I know this probably isn't surprising to many people. Um, in 2020, the Law Study of Ontario Lawyer Change Survey found 41% of female lawyers cited a lack of balance between work and family life as a reason for leaving private practice. And for female lawyers under the age of 45, this accounted for 58% of the reason. Uh, the survey also looked at licensees who were submitting the notices of change to the LSO. And they didn't include, because I know this would skew the numbers, they didn't include those who were leaving for maternity leave, uh, parental leave, or retirement. But they found that those who were submitting notices of changes were 59% women compared to 41% who were male. And in the under 35 year age group category, it was 22% women and 11% men. And then when we go to the 35 to 44 age group, 21% women. Um, and 11% men. So even if we're discounting uh, parental leave, because I think that would skew the numbers and increase it um, to women, that still accounted for a large amount uh, percentage of women leaving. Um, and the, find, the survey concluded that there is still a challenge with private practice retention for female lawyers. Some of the key trends the survey noted was that women who left private practice for non-private practice are more likely than men to report work-life balance as a reason. Um, and there was the University of Sherbrooke that did a research report, and they looked at the period of 2020 to 2022. So we're in the pandemic here. So that was it was a good report because it did have some pandemic um, issues in that in that study. But anyways, the study looked at lawyers who did not wish to have children due to work obligations by their work setting, and it divided it into private practice, uh, public or not for profit, for profit organization, and the education sector. And it found those working in private practice were more likely than those in the work setting to choose not to have children uh, because of professional obligations. Uh, they looked at those who were apprehensive to start a family broken down by gender and the survey showed 33.1% of women had a high apprehension about career consequences versus only 15% of male. And again, not surprising because in private practice, we're looking at challenges like billing hours and targets and a lot of firms that are doing those. Um, so, I mean, it's not surprising also that that the conclusion in a lot of these studies found that once these women are leaving private practice, vast majority of them report that they're unlikely to return. Um, and again, I think that's finding work-life balance in out of private practice. Uh, through the research and trends, I think the conclusion is that, yes, we do have more women working in law as the decades have gone on, but it's still a very masculine profession where you need to be seen as competitive, um, work long hours, meet and exceed targets, and you're coupling that with gender roles that still exist, with women taking on more of the parenting and the housework. So it doesn't seem surprising, at least to me, that we have a retention problem in the profession. And in my view, I don't think things are going to get better unless significant changes are made. Um, it's a patriarchal society that wants to reward women for being able to do it all. But in my view, I mean, we shouldn't have to do it all. You know, we feel empowered to, but again, it's, I think we need to, to see sort of um, more of a balance across the board in, in some different ways. That's it for me. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. And I, I totally agree. Um, actually, why don't we run our poll really quickly and then I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me. So in your, in your opinion, what are the leading cause or causes of stress for women in the profession? And please feel free to um, pick multiple choices if you'd like. So just a little bit of a story about me. I don't think either Sonia or Kim, you know the story. Um, when I came to the firm seven and a half years ago, I was at a crossroads and I had actually, um, like your stat Kim, I had actually, I was at the end of a mat leave and I knew I did not want to go back to my other firm. I had taken some 
time off during my mat leave and had gained some perspective and realized that was not the place um, for me. And uh, I had applied to go into a government job. And I actually have a friend, Darla, uh, who was working at the firm and she insisted. She said, come in, just meet Russ. I know you, you feel like this is not the profession and this is not the, um, you know, the place for women, but just come in and meet him. And so I came in and I, you know, did the whole thing. I dressed for the interview. I had my resume in those days it was printed. So I printed my resume and I had my references all printed out and I had my little, you know, binder ready to go with samples of my work. And I sat down with Russ and, you know, we're just having a coffee. And I say to him, look, I'm at a crossroads. I have a little guy. So I just come off of Matt Leaf with my little guy. Uh, he wasn't even a year yet. And he has some serious health issues and we're going to be, doing this therapy where I need to drive to Hamilton once a week um, and it has to be during the week. So I, I cannot work five days a week. I must only work four days a week. And I understand that this is a law practice and that's not something that's normal. And he said, Michelle, just tell me the day. Pick the day. I don't care. Just tell me right now. And I said, uh, well, the days are Friday. <laughs> you know, it could change. And he said, no problem. And I said, okay, well, here's my, re do, you, do you want my resume? Do you want my references? And he said, no, Darla said you're great. So you're hired. And I said, no, 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 I, I, I don't think you understand. Here's my resume. <laughs> you need to read this. <laughs> Look at my, my law school exam marks. Look at my bar exam marks. Look at it. He's like, no, we're, we're good. And um, so, you know, it really does go back. I think you're, you're so right, Kim, with those statistics. We, we live in a, in a world where a lot of the partners are males and there is a way of doing things. And we need to break out of that mold. And the more that we as women, one, get into positions of leadership and two, talk about these things and, and bring it to people's attention. And the more men who attend webinars like this and, and you know, educate themselves about what's going on, the better. Because I truly think that you know, the women in our firm are phenomenal. They're amazing and they're such an asset and I'm so glad they're with us today. All right, so let's see the results of our poll. <sighs> yeah, uh, so pretty much a little bit of everything. Lack of resources, 20%, work-life -life conflict, exactly as Kim mentioned, 71%, family responsibility, 79%, uh, workload relationships and emotional demands all around the 25 to 40%. Job insecurity, really big one, uh, especially with those mat leaves. I've had four kids. I understand <laughs> the job insecurity and lack of recognition. Thanks so much for that. All right. So, Kim, why don't you talk to us a little bit about gender disparities? Yeah. So the gender disparities, I mean, following a little bit uh, with the statistics and trends. Um, so, as I said before, we still have women being underrepresented in top leadership positions. And in the legal profession, this means as managing partners in law firms and being general counsel in large corporations. And I know, you know, in my personal experience of speaking to other lawyers, um, many of the times when they're in-house counsel, if they are a female, they, they feel it is a boys club. They might be the only female sitting there as an in-house counsel. Um, on average, disappointing, but on average, we still have female lawyers earning less than their male counterparts. Um, and it seems that women still have a steeper climb than their male colleagues. The Canadian Bar Association did an article in 2022, and there's a phenomenon that they call the sticky floor phenomenon. And this is where women are falling behind men at the beginning of their careers due to the invisible or unrecognizable barriers. And part of this is we have the prime childbearing age for women that happens at the same time that women are also trying to build their legal careers. Um, and this is a challenge, right? We feel there's this, as women, there's this biological window and, and you know, you, you've got to stick with it and it becomes a, it feels like you have to pick one or the other, right? You either want kids and it's now or never, um, and you've got to put your career on the back burner. And I'm sure um, all three of us could probably, you know, speak to, to that being something that is an issue. Um, even in terms of income, so there's outdated research from the Law State of Ontario, goes back to 2002, um, but they looked at the gross annual earnings after business deductions and before taxes, 
And if we're looking at the over 300,000 um, a year income, 18% of men earned this compared to 9% of women. If we look at between 100,000 and 149,000, 29% were men and 31% women. Um, and, and then at the 100,000 level, it's 77% men, 67% women. So the conclusion was, yes, the earnings increased for both men and women, but the gender differences still really did remain. Um, the research also looked at earnings by professional position and across the board, men have a higher mean average earnings. So the role in sole practitioners, the average male was earning 126,000 compared to female sole practitioners who were earning about 86,000. And again, if we look at employees or associates of a law firm, the mean salary for a male was 139,000 and for women it's 96,000. Um, so again, I mean, I wish I, I, I was surprised, but then I also wasn't at the same time to hear that the uh, pay disparity still exists. Um, you know, we still have a society where women are in the workforce and working in roles that are equal to their male counterparts, but also still bearing the brunt of the childcare roles, and this impacts the career advancements. Female lawyers experience more career interruptions due to family-related issues than male lawyers, and this can also impact female lawyers re-entering the profession when there are gaps in their resumes. So again, in 2002, Ontario survey looked at lawyers who had interruptions between their first and second positions and found women were more likely than men to experience job interruptions. And with that survey, women than men reported childcare as the primary activity during work interruptions, while men were more likely to report travel or further education. So again, surprising, but not surprising um, to hear. Uh, I, I think the workplace needs to address the gender disparity and some of the ways I feel that this could be done is having family friendly policies such as top up for maternity leave and flexible work arrangements, which we're so lucky to have at this firm and, and um, I know for me having young kids was and is um, life changing and I think probably the only reason I can I can be in this profession in in private practice. Um, equal pay initiatives, so workplaces can have policies that promote pay equity. Equal opportunities, ensuring that any career advancements or roles are equally accessible, regardless of gender and regardless of someone's family-related decisions and obligations. Um, I think the increase of women in the legal field, it is a great advancement, but we need to focus and make sure it translates to these women making advances in the representation in higher ranks within law firms and in-house counsel. Um, as I was going through the data, I feel family law, and, and that's what we all practice, is a little bit different than a lot of the other legal professions because it is female dominated. So I think some of these challenges that impact a lot of the leadership roles and pay and equity may be a little bit less obvious um, in family law. Um, again, a little outdated, but the Law City of Ontario in 2002 looked at the most common fields practiced by women. And 23% of women said other, followed by 18% who said family law. Um, so family law came in the top three practice areas for women, but it was not the top three for men. So that's why I think that, you know, it, it, is, it is very different looking at family law in the legal field versus the others. The Law Society of Ontario paper from 2002 uh, also looked at the hours spent working on law-related matters. And I think it was telling for me on how women are trying to fit in work at different hours than traditional hours. And I, I, I think this came down to gender roles. So the survey broke down the average number of hours worked in private practice on weekdays, weekends, and evening and weekend hours worked in the office. So the average number of hours worked during the week was 9.3 for men and 9.1 for women, which wasn't a huge difference. On weekends, we have the average for both men and women being at 3.6. And then we go to working in the office on evenings and weekends. And we have men at 4.3 and women at 4.5. Again, not a huge difference, but I think what that's showing is women were trying to make up on weekends and evenings what they lost during that work week. Um, the same 2002 survey looked at the number of hours spent on childcare and men reported spending 13 23 hours on childcare per week, while women were spending 34 
0.61 hours per week. And to me, that's shocking because we're working essentially two full-time jobs now. Um, the study concludes that women decreased their hours slightly more with school-age children, whereas men did not. And there were, when there were children in the home over the age of 18, we see women increase their hours. So again, um, not surprising, I think the conclusion, you know, there, there tends to be trends and we see gender disparity with pay, with hours, and how, um, when women are trying to be productive in the profession. Thanks so much, Kim. And I think that the COVID pandemic really highlighted this, right? Because um, I don't know about you, but I saw all of my female um, friends who are in the legal profession. And it, it unfortunately really did fall to them. It fell to them to, to pick up the extra childcare. You know, I, I still have flashbacks and, and horrible memories of being at work and, and try, sorry, being in front of my computer and trying to work and then having three kids doing online schooling, one of whom was in JK and had never used a laptop. Let's be honest, right? He, he was a baby. He doesn't know how to use a laptop. He doesn't know how to use a mouse. Every 10 seconds, he's pushing something by mistake or closing something or the volume goes up, you know, and your, your client saying, what's that in the background? Are you at a train station? No, that's just 30 children screaming at each other. <laughs> um, and I know so many females who, who their typical schedule is they go to work at about, you know, sometime between three and five, they uh, either leave to pick up their kids or go home, do the after school homework, dinner thing, and then they go back and they do another couple of hours at night. And I can see the impact on their health. I can see an impact on, you know, their weight and and um, kind of chronic illnesses. We know that lack of sleep and stress create a lot of health issues. So, you know, burning the candle at both ends is something I see often. What about you, Sonia and Kim? Are you seeing that in your friends and colleagues? I definitely think so. I mean, I and I think that that you're right. Like especially during the pandemic, so much of childcare and doing that um, virtual schooling fell on women, I think more women, and I think there were studies on this as well about uh, just in general, in terms of, of across the board and professions, during the pandemic, there was a huge flux of women who actually left their jobs. Um, and I'm waiting to see whether the research has indicated a lot of these women returning to the profession, um, professions in general, because it was, it was just in general, uh, or whether a lot of these women had trouble going back to work because of these gaps in, in resumes. Because again, I think if you have women in leadership, we understand what happened in those years. Um, but someone who might not have children or someone who didn't have to deal with that because they had a partner at home um, might not understand those gaps. Yeah, I'm gonna have to completely agree with all of this. Um, I personally have uh, two friends who are in the law field uh, who completely stopped, just just cold turkey stopped because they realized that their attention needed to be on their children. Um, they're both female and their male counterparts work their other job and they have no choice. And they said, you know, when my kids are older, I'll, I'll go back into the profession of law and continue on. Then I have other friends, uh, three of them who are happy and they are healthy and they are strong and they're all teachers. <laughs> And, uh, and their, you know, their schedule is a lot different and they have the time for uh, more work-life balance. Um, and just, just, the, just, I think working in the legal environment is just a lot more demanding, especially um, if you're a full-time mom, if you're a full-time employee, uh, that's just my experience. Absolutely. Thanks so much for that. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about leadership and mentorship. Um, so I am the senior managing lawyer at the firm, and that was a relatively new uh, promotion about just over a year ago. Um, but I think, and I credit a lot of the females that came before me and that who continue to um, support me for that. And the first piece of advice I have for any young lawyer or really any lawyer is to find your mentors, right? And your mentors are, find your team, find, find your community really, because I think you really need a number of set of people in your life to, to help you with this. So the first set is colleagues and friends. 
I think it is so important to have people who are at your age and stage of life going through the same things with you, whether that's a brand new call where you're trying to figure out how to navigate it all, you know, docketing, um, billable hours, expectations, all of those things, whether you're in the parenting stage and figuring out, you know, how you're going to um, tell your boss that you're pregnant. I know I had to, I thought about that. I, I kind of planned how I was going to do that and when I was going to do that and strategically so um, based on the boss that I had at the time. Um, so having those friends and colleagues are so important and shout out to the three women in my life who are absolutely fantastic and have been with me since law school. And um, I'm so extremely blessed to have them in my life. And also to Windsor Law, uh, we are, we've been so amazing. It's been such a great group. We don't get to see each other um, as often as we would like to, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that you don't get to see each other often. Everyone is still so helpful. We still refer people to one another. If uh, I have a question about criminal law or if I have a question about real estate law, I have people from my law school that I can call and it's like no time has passed. You know, they're so happy to to help. And, and same with me, if somebody calls, I want to spend the time with them and I want to tell them as much as I can. Um, so the other, um, so so the advice is surround yourself with those people and learn from them because it's a it's a community thing that we're all kind of learning the strategies and navigating. There's no handbook to tell you how to do some of these things, right? Nowhere is it going to tell you how do you tell your boss that you're pregnant and when and and you know what what should you do? You'll know a little bit about the law, but that's that's really about it. Um, and then the next thing is senior lawyers. And these can come from a couple of different places. One, within your firm, I think it's so important to build those relationships, whether they are with women or with men, having those senior lawyers um, on your team, knowing that you can call them if something happens, knowing that you have someone to turn to it for advice. Um, I think it's really important. We do a lot of crowdsourcing in our firm. Uh, we use something called Slack, which is a messaging board. And I'll be honest, I'm not on it as much as I should be because of my, you know, dual obligations as a lawyer and a, and a manager. But um, I'm so proud every time I open it and I see within, you know, an hour, someone asking a question, someone is saying, oh, yeah, here's a factum or here's some case law or, hey, you know, the, I'm the article student. I'm going to I can do a memo on that. No big deal. Give me, you know, a day or two. It, it's so wonderful. Um, the other piece of advice I have for kind of more junior lawyers or maybe if you're new to the firm is to um, try to get a little bit of FaceTime in there. I know it's terrible. I um, I really need to practice what I preach more. I need to go into the office more. Um, but we have a day. Tuesdays are the day that we um, get together as a firm, both in the office and virtually. We actually have a lunch that the firm uh, provides every Tuesday. And it's a really nice opportunity to sit and to chat and to catch up with your colleagues. And I can't stress how much having just that little bit of FaceTime, it only needs to be one day a week, um, how far it goes when you have a question or a concern or something that is urgent that you know you've built those relationships and you can call those people. Um, I always like to say phone and in-person is best. So if you can't do in-person, then pick up the phone as well. Uh, if you can't, email or a message board works as well outside your firm. I think it's also really good and really important that you have colleagues or senior counsel outside of your firm to refer to as well. Let's be honest, our firm is still a work in progress. You know, we want every single day to make it better and better. And I'm often so interested to see what other um, people do and what other firms do. I think I may have talked about this recently in another webinar, but there was another firm in Durham that during COVID actually opened up their border because remember no one was coming into the office and so for those times that the kids were doing the virtual school what they would do is they would have all the kids in the boardroom and they would allocate one person at a time so you for one hour a day let's say eight to nine or ten to twelve you would know that you would have the boardroom classroom and you would you could still bring your laptop you could still work let's be honest you're probably not going to get a whole lot done 
But instead of scrambling to find childcare when childcare was closed or, you know, illnesses, they really banded together as a firm and they created a solution that worked for everybody and allowed all of the wonderful women in that firm to work. So kudos to them. I was really inspired by that story. And I thought, what a wonderful out of the box solution that, you know, the firm was making money, the, the children got to know one another, everyone got to work. It, it just was such a, a smart solution that they had come up with that could really have been, if I knew about it during COVID, that could really have benefited our firm a little bit more. Um, the next group is senior people outside of law. I think that it's also nice to know what other industries are doing, right? In law, we tend to have a very um, set perspective. Let's put it that way. Billable hours, um, you know, you, you've got to get your docketing in, you've got to do this. But it is interesting to see what other people are doing and how they're handling things and um, learn from different, you know, different experiences. And of course, you're going to say to me, Michelle, how do I meet these people? Right. How in this day and age, when we're so busy, when we're all, you know, things are going on, how do we meet these wonderful women? Well, one, I truly believe that you can kind of tell within five or 10 minutes who your people are, right? You, you know, the people who are, are going to be nice and, and, you know, friendly, but I think within five or 10 minutes, you can really truly find your, your friends. And um, uh, one really good piece of advice I have is join the different law associations and go to the events, go to the dinner you know, schmooze, spend that time. I know it's hard. As a mom, I'm always putting the kids first, always. I'll always say, look, you know, I'd rather be the one to take my kid to, I don't know, hockey, even though all I'm really doing is I'm the chauffeur, I'm dropping her off. She's going to hockey for an hour and a half and playing on my phone and, you know, maybe watching some Netflix while I can. And then she's off the ice. That time could be so well used um, going to these events, meeting people, learning, um, volunteer, be on the committees. A lot of the committees these days are via Zoom. So it's actually a not as much time commitment as it used to be. Zoom has really made in some ways our lives a lot easier and a lot more accessible. Um, for people outside of your field, networking events, there's a lot of women's associations and um, community associations that you can join. Uh, there is, sorry guys. For instance, the Ontario Bar Association has a young lawyers division. I live in Toronto, but I live on the border of Toronto and Pickering. So for me, going downtown maybe isn't the best way, but Durham also has a women's association and I'm sure there are associations all uh, throughout. There's a trial lawyers association, you know, so there's a lot of different associations that you can join uh, within your community. I also think that volunteering is a really great way to do it. And, uh, Another kind of insider story about me, during the pandemic, I had um, organized a, a little community team to sew um, medical masks for the hospitals. Remember that time when we could even get medical masks and we had to create these pockets so that the medical masks can go in and you could wash it. It was absolutely horrible and insane to think that actually happened. Um, but from that, I met a really good friend of mine who continues to be a friend who is a real estate lawyer. And she is phenomenal. Her marketing skills and her sales skills are so amazing. And as lawyers, or, or maybe I'll just speak for myself, I suck at marketing and sales. <laughs> and I feel like that's not something we learn in law school, right? That's not even something that we talk about in law school. But so much of this has to do with marketing and sales and how you present yourself and how we meet clients and how we get prospective clients in the door. Um, and so I'm constantly in awe of her expertise and I've stolen ideas from her and used it at our firm. And of course, there are formal mentorship programs. Uh, regional law libraries are wonderful. Get to know your local law librarians. Uh, Jenny and Lee, you're phenomenal. We love you. Um, you know, the, the Law Society also has a mentorship program for all of Ontario. And again, lots of these could be done via Zoom. Okay, sorry guys, I'm talking a lot. Okay, uh, <laughs> so Kim and Sonia, do you guys have, uh, did you guys have any mentors while you were kind of going through this? And I see, sorry, Shannon, I know you're, um, 
you're putting up the poll. So please go ahead and answer the poll while we chat. You know, I am Michelle listening to your experience is, is very different from mine, which is going to be very different from someone else in the audience. But I was an internationally trained lawyer and I know Sonia's in the same boat. So I found like because of that, um, I wasn't able to network with people who are practicing in Ontario and have other family law lawyer friends or have other friends in different industries. So any of my, you know, colleagues turned friends are just people I've, I, since I've been practicing. So I think that was a negative, right? That, that I didn't have, I don't have those connections from law school. Um, and so I think that translated into, at least for me, and we'll speak to Sonia, but just less mentorship um, that came organically, right? I know there's, there's like you said, um, different ways you can join things. Uh, just in terms of the organic mentorship, I never had that. Uh, and I think part of that was that, that experience with law school. And then on, on the flip side, you know, the other things that you talked about, I struggle with that because again, I'm trying to balance a full-time practice and being a full-time mom. And I feel like I'm spread thin. I can't possibly commit to another volunteer, another board position, another anything else. Like I'm running at capacity, right? So um, it's, it's a real challenge. It really is. But your kids are also a little bit younger than mine, right? Remember, so yeah. my, my oldest is turning 13. She's becoming a teenager. So I have a little bit more flexibility. Even though I have a little one, my, my youngest is three. The 12-year-old can take care of the three-year-old for an hour while I go do something. Or a lot of the activities I do, I can now take them to. So for instance, one of the things we've been thinking as a family is uh, there's so much food insecurity. And I live in such an interesting neighborhood because... There is a, there are literally tracks. And on one side of the tracks, we have people who, we have a school, a sister school, where there's a food bank in the school. And on our side of the tracks, we have a, a school where we're very fortunate and it's a, usually a dual income household. So we've partnered with that school and we've, um, uh, our school and their school, and, and we help to um, fundraise for some of their events. But I've also thought about maybe going to a food bank and volunteering with my two oldest and making it a family thing so that they get to, you know, experience that and see how other people live. Because I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. What about you, Sonia? Same exact boat as Kimberly. Yeah. I was internationally trained. My articling experience with Kimberly at the time was not very mentorship-ish, sorry, if that makes any sense. Mine too, um, don't worry. Mine yeah. too. <laughs> and I would say that, to be honest with you, as of now, I'm receiving most of my mentorship here from you, from Bill, from Darla. That is where I'm receiving it all. And I'm, you know, absorbing it. I'm, I'm taking it all in and I'm appreciating it. And aside from that, I don't have, I don't have the, the resources to stretch outside of, my little bubble as of now. So that's where I am right now. Yeah. And imagine, I, I mean, we're all, we're all so busy, but imagine if we did band together, right? Yeah. I, know, um, I know there is a Facebook group. I don't know if anyone uh, in the audience is on the Facebook group, but just search it. But uh, there's a, there's a female lawyer Facebook group. And there is an Ontario Family Lawyer Facebook group. And the issues that come up in both, it's really interesting, right? Because the female one, I, I think there are a lot of discussion about, you know, mentorship, um, trying to crowdsource jobs for people, trying to make sure that you find uh, good clerks and assistants. I think there's a very... Um, I hate to say there's a really big sense of community in the women's one, which I don't quite so much see in the in the Ontario one. So I, I really think it is, we have to band together. We have to look out for one another and the people in leadership need to, you know, um, help the others up the run. Okay, so the poll results. Uh, so how much parental leave do people take? Okay, so three months or under. I have four kids, two of my kids I took three months for. Uh, that's 16%, three to six months, 24%. Six to 12 months, 35%. So interestingly, the other two kids I took 12 months for. And then 12 months plus 10% of us and other uh, 20%. And I think we're going to see a little bit more of the 12 plus months because the 18 month um, allowance is new, right? It's only about two or three years old that you've been able to take 18 months. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, Kim, you've got a really, uh, a really good topic next. 
Oh, sorry, is it you? Did I skip somebody? No, I don't think it's me. Oh, I apologize. Who's up next? That would be you. <laughs> me again? Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. Why are we all talking about me? <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Um, so women in the workplace, promoting inclusivity. Um, so uh, thanks so much, Sonia, for saying that. That was really sweet of you. One of the things, and I can just speak from my experience. And again, I'm so new to this. I'm learning. So if you have tips and tricks for me, please put it in the chat. I'd love to hear it. So one of the first things I do is when we have people join the team, I automatically send them, assign them up with the junior manager. So as of day one, they have weekly um uh, sessions for a half hour with their junior manager. And that's a, you know, all open topic. If you want to talk about your kids, if you want to talk about your work, if you want to talk about the rules, if you want to vent about another lawyer, <laughs> that's a, that's a free for all. But I also like to meet with them myself. And I do it for, you know, between one and three months, depending on how that particular person and the reason I like to do it is kind of two big reasons. Number one, I want them to get to know me, right? I don't want me, I don't want to be a face on a screen, you know, the, the, the talking head on Zoom. I want them to get to know me, to know my life, to know my children. I want to know their children's names. I want to know what's going on in their lives. And I want them to know that they can pick up the phone at any time or send me an email and I will work for them. Like I will get things done. Um, it's also hard. It's also hard joining a firm this big with 50 people. It's really easy to feel isolated. I don't want anyone to feel isolated. And if you're feeling isolated, I want to know. Because I'll, I'll ask leading questions like, oh, you know, did you talk to anyone else about this problem? Or, you know, what did your manager have to say? Just to kind of get a, a, a feeler of uh, what's going on and if they're connecting. And, you know, if I think that that something's, you know, maybe they can need help with something else, I might help them myself, or I might show them where they can get those resources. Um, I also, um, I also want to know how they're fitting in and, you know, if they're having any experiences that we want to nip that in the bud, right? We want to make sure that they're feeling comfortable in this workspace. Um, and if anyone's struggling, I will pick up the phone. If I, if I see, um, we had some data a couple of years ago that seemed that an employee's hours were going down. It was just unlike them. And so after picking up the phone, I found out that there was a family issue that was going on. And so it was great. We were able to, to control that before any deadlines have been missed, before that person really felt overwhelmed. We we're able to um, manage their caseload you know, reallocate some of their files and court appearances to another lawyer, not take away their files, but just reallocate for a short time while they were able to, um, you know, get back on their feet and, and figure it out. We um, also do gratitude very often. And I don't know if you guys have heard this, but there was this thing that was going around in all the mom groups where this teacher would um, every week ask the kids in an anonymous survey who they wanted to sit with. And they weren't doing it because they wanted to see who the kids wanted to sit with. They were doing it because they wanted to see which kids did weren't getting picked, right? What kids were feeling isolated and which kids weren't maybe connecting. And so we do a lot of gratitude. It's really interesting to me. I love to see the different bonds and the, you know, oh, this person's now kind of hanging out with this person. That's wonderful. That's, that's, that's such a great pairing. Um, and, you know, if you have people who are like, oh, yeah, you know, gratitude is always the same person and it's not kind of branching out, we may want to, you know, step in and make sure that person feels comfortable. I mean, hey, it's your choice. If, you're, if your position is to work and to lead, I'm totally fine with that. But if you're feeling like you're struggling and you're not fitting in and you don't feel like you have a place to turn, I want to know that. Um, so it's really not a one size fit all. The other thing we do a lot is anonymous surveys. It's nice to know, let's say one or two people come and we're like, hey, I wonder if that's this is affecting the whole team. We do an anonymous survey on SurveyMonkey and we get to see, okay, maybe no, it's just those couple of people will deal with that or no, this is a bigger team issue. How can we fix this, right? Uh, Sonia and Kim, any, uh, oh dear, sorry, I can't. We've got to move on, I'm talking too much. Uh, why don't we move on to the next one, maternity leave? Yeah, so that's me. Um, I'll, I'll try to be fairly fast, as passionate of a topic I feel this is. Um, you know, this is, again, a, a challenge in this profession for many reasons. And, and I can only speak to the private practice 
Um, but you know, a lot of times if you're, if you're an employee, all you may, uh, qualify for is young and that's a huge, um, that's a huge issue. Um, and, and I think it requires planning, um, which sometimes is hard to do, uh, because you might just not be able to, uh, to, to, you know, you have firms, you have these big firms or other industries where you hear about top up happening. I don't find that's the norm in private practice. Um, and so in terms of even transitioning files, I know for me, um, it's not billable time, right? So you're losing money as you're transitioning onto that mat leave. You're trying to reallocate responsibilities, different files. Um, the bigger challenge for me personally was coming back, coming back from those mat leaves and feeling like oh, I missed a chunk of time. And in the legal profession and in family law, things are always changing. Cases are new cases, new law. And so to take a year off, I took, I took just over a year off with both kids. And I found that I came back and it felt like I didn't know the profession anymore. Right. I felt, and Michelle, I remember talking to you when I came back saying, I'm feeling really rusty. I'm feeling like, is this the same profession I left? Every, um, every, I have never heard a female lawyer come back and say, I'm ready to go. Everyone and I'm has- starting to notice that now, right? I am starting to notice that. I, you said that to me and I, I do notice that. But, you know, coming back, you're starting, again, a lot of it's billable hours and you're starting coming back at a file load of zero and building that practice. It's a huge commitment and you're trying to balance this new uh, new baby. So I think there's a lot of um, a lot of sacrifices that happen, right? And a lot of, um, again, and I don't know, I don't know what the answer would be in this profession of how we can do to, to foster maternity leave other than, you know, companies that um, have this top up and have those benefits. Um, but I think, I think that is a big problem that we're seeing in private practice. And I think it's part of what, why we see a retention problem. And if anyone in our audience in private practice has seen top ups and things like that, it's something that I'm personally advocating for within our firm, but there's no struck. It's hard. It's, it's creating it from scratch. It'd be so nice to see what other people are doing. All right. Uh, thanks so much, Kim. Uh, why don't we uh, move on to the next one, which I think is a poll. And while we're running our poll, we'll have Sonia talk a little bit about um, her topic. Right. Having children. It's beautiful. So the impact of women working in the legal profession and having children is difficult. And I'm sure both of you can understand. Most of you who are viewing can also understand. Um, I personally am a mother of two young little girls. I have close to nine years experience in the legal field. However, I'm currently only a junior lawyer. I was recently called to the bar. Uh, there, and this is my story. My eldest daughter was when she was born, she had a stroke during the while she had a stroke during delivery and was immediately rushed to Sick Kids Hospital due to the significant damage to her left hemisphere. We were told to prepare our home for wheelchair accessibility because she would be paralyzed on her left side. And we were also told that she would be blind at least in one eye. And as many of you would suspect, my entire personal, sorry, my entire professional career was put on hold as a result because I had to take care of her. Um, I took her to all of her daily, almost daily sick kids appointments and I lived nowhere near downtown Toronto. Her occupational therapy appointments, her physiotherapy appointments, her specialist appointments for her eyes and neurological issues. Um, I didn't have parents around uh, to help. Both my parents and my husband's parents were both still full working full time. And my husband tried to the best of his ability to be there for these appointments and to help out. But unfortunately, she wanted her mommy. So I took a few years off and eventually decided to uh, enter back into the sorry, enter back into the law world as a law clerk. And I continued, so I was had the ability and the flexibility to care for her. Although uh, it was still difficult because working for, as a full-time mom and an employee anywhere in any in any field is difficult. But I found it even more challenging working in the legal field. Eventually, I had to even stop working in the legal field completely as a law clerk because my employer at the time. Uh, while I was law clerking, didn't appreciate the amount of time I had to take off work to attend to my child. So the legal environment, as you know, overall is just is, is demanding and it is so difficult 
uh, to have a child or a sick child um, in school, not in school, taking them to, to um, appointments. It's just, it's just hard. And it's, you, you feel defeated. You feel, sometimes you feel, I felt worthless. Sometimes I just, I felt like I wasn't successful at anything. And, you know, it, it, it's such as life. It's been seven years. She is amazing now. And I'm now a lawyer. So, so it, it all did work out in the end. It just took, it took a, it took a while. So that's my personal experience with having children. I don't know if um, any of you guys wanted to add to this topic. That's such an inspiring story, Sonia. It's, it's so sweet. I know I've heard it before, but tearing up hearing it again. But um, absolutely, and so many people, I don't know about you, Kim, but I know so many women who have had struggles with birth, and I know the statistics are that female lawyers suffer a much higher rate of miscarriage or um, issues, uh, children having medical issues after they're born. And I really think it's the stress. I really do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, we should move on. So the poll results, yeah, not surprising. Most of us don't, and that's my answer as well. Um, my husband took four days off <laughs> for each child. Technically, he did take um, a couple weeks off with my last because it was mandatory at his work. But I really found it interesting because even though it was mandatory, he was working still and they were emailing him and they were still expecting him to do work. So it's interesting that uh, paternity leave policies are also showing that there is an expectation that people work even while they're off. Okay, empowering women in the legal profession, take it away. That's me. So I know that sometimes it's, you might feel, it's very easy to feel stressed out, but women need to remember that there are resources and support groups out there uh, available to provide mentorship and guidance. Um, I, I think we have, at the end of this, we have listed a few of the links. So I have um, the Women's Law Association of Ontario, that's one, which offers woman-to-woman -woman mentoring and uh, networking geared towards addressing the needs of women, specifically in the profession, uh, from a female perspective. Uh, taken directly from their website, here's a, just a small quote, uh, women could likely provide valuable advice to one another more readily than a male counterpart. Perhaps a mentor has already dealt successfully with a child or elder care, and their impact on their ability to balance home and work life Perhaps sexual stereotypes are a problem as are a problem as a mentor as has faced this issue earlier in her career and can offer workable options or solutions. So that's uh, that's a big one there. And then I have a second one. So the, the Law Society of Ontario has launched their new Women's Resource Center, which is an online hub specifically designed to support the retention and advancement of professionals identifying as women in private practice, in-house government positions, and even articling students. Whether you're looking for work or you want to excel at your work, this online hub provides excellent resources and guidance, checklists and strategies and references. So those are two big ones that, I've, uh, that I am very passionate about. Thanks so much, Sonia. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about intersectionality, diversity, um, so, you know, kind of the, the first group I want to talk about is the LGB, oh, sorry, I'm trying to say it too fast, LGBTQIS plus community. And while I'm not um, a part of that community, I am a huge ally. And some of my favorite people in the world are part of that community. And I'm talking family members, very close family members to me. Um, so I think it's really important that we as lawyers check our biases and that we make sure we have an open and inclusive um, uh, workspace, not just for us, but also for our clients. Number one, it's the law. You know, we're not allowed to discriminate against anyone due to the community that they belong in. Um, but I also think that's the bare minimum. I think that's just being a human being is making sure that people feel that they are um, able to be who they are. I think that we need to really work hard to make sure that people who have been uh, discriminated against feel that they are 
part of our community and they are an equal part of our community. And I think one of the things that we do at our firm that I really like is terminology. So at the bottom of our emails, we use pronouns and, and we um, show that we are willing and able to use whatever pronoun a person chooses to use for themselves, not simply the pronoun that they were assigned at birth. Um, and I also think it's important because we have a lot of clients who belong to these communities and we need to make sure that they feel uh, safe, respected, and that they can talk about some of these issues with their legal team because it does impact your family law matter. Um, then when we talk about EDI, uh, again, as uh, Shannon said, today qualifies for one hour of EDI. So please remember to put it into the portal. It's really important. Um, but the Law Society mandates that everyone do at least one hour of EDI. And again, at our firm, that is the bare minimum. We do uh, three to four times a year. We do EDI sessions on a variety of topics. It's crowdsourced, so we do a poll and we try to pick um, the topics that most people are interested in and we, we spread it out through the year. We give people as much notice as we can so that you can plan around it. Um, and I think the Law Society is doing a really good job of it. I went online today just to check. And in 2023 alone, they have over 16 hours of free resources on this issue. And that's just 2023. There's about four or five years of resources. And the topics are really great, really diverse. Uh, Black History Month, International Women's Day, Holocaust Remembrance Day, Asian and South Asian Heritage Month, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. The list goes on and on. So, you know, what a, a really great range of topics. And it's you know, we all know it's a sad truth that not everyone in our profession feels this way. And we all remember the venture elections and, you know, we won't get into that here. But I think that it is important for those of us who are allies to advertise that and to make ourselves known so that people who are looking for services know where to go or, or employees feel that they this is a safe space for them to come and have a job. So really quickly, things you can do, putting your pronouns into your email signature. It, it's a subtle way, but people realize that you have that training and you understand what that means and you agree that pronouns are important. Ensuring your website is clear, having pride events and celebrating pride months, having multicultural events, recognizing and celebrating holidays from all sorts of different cultures and backgrounds, not just the traditional statutory holidays that we, we have. Um, having a diverse team. And if you look at our team, we are a very diverse team, which I'm always very excited about. And supporting your diverse team by allowing them and making sure that they're able to take time off for their cultural celebrations and religious holidays. All right, uh, let's go on to the next poll. So this is a really great one. Uh, what is the most important change you see for women in the legal field and in the future? And um, while people are answering that, why don't we talk uh, just a little bit about um, what you think you would like to see? Kim, can I pick on you to go first? I think I already know from your topics. <laughs> I look. I, I think flexibility um, is a huge one that I think is is. Um, I, I know, like I said, everyone's personal situation is different. For me, having that flexibility. Um, and I think just closing that gap with, with the gender disparity when it comes to pay, I just would overall love to see, I, I, I love working with all my female colleagues. It's nice to see we're in the profession. I'd like to see that retention. Yeah, absolutely. Sonia, what about you? So I, same, uh, work uh, flexibility with remote work, personally working remotely, uh, work-life balance, it means the world to me. And I couldn't, like I could not function as a mother and as a wife unless I had this flexibility to work uh, from home. Uh, it allows me to, you know what? It also allows me to take breaks. Like you're, you're on the computer, you, you take a break to, I don't know, even vacuum the house, for example. Mm -hmm. You come back and all of a sudden you feel more, more motivated, more interested in work, you're more energized. So personally, like that is number one for me, the flexibility to work remotely. I also um, I want to see more females and more females in leadership roles. Um, I feel like there's a, there's something to be said about having a connection, like a female connection with another female, and perhaps you know, for example, Michelle, you you are a, a woman in a leadership role, and 
you have four children and you understand when I say, <laughs> oh my God, my guy got a call from the school. I have to run to go pick up my daughter. Like you understand that. A male counterpart as a managing lawyer, I don't know if they would completely understand that. Maybe they would think at the back of their head, well, can't you find someone else to go pick them up? You know, I don't know. So that to me is also really important. And that's what I'd like to see. Thanks so much, Sonia. Yeah, I fully agree. My number one um, is having more women in leadership. I think it's really important. And, you know, we are very fortunate at our firm. If you actually look at the people who are in the leadership roles, there are more women than men at our firm, which I think is a really great um, thing. Let's hear what our audience uh, had to say. Yeah, yeah, flexibility in remote work, absolutely. So plug for the firm, we are fully remote, which means that everyone you see here is in their homes. And if you heard my dog bark a minute ago, you would have known I was in my house. Um, and, and I think it's so important, right? Because the days I do go into the office, I love the, I think it's important and I think it is really good to go in that one day a week. But the rest of the week, instead of spending an hour and a half traveling back and forth and getting dressed, I spend two minutes walking to my desk, right? I start work earlier. I do more billable hours because I am working mostly remotely. And, you know, I have the ability if, um, you know, so something happens at the school that I can drop everything and go to the school, pick up the kids, put them, you know, put them uh, with an iPad and then get back to work within 10 minutes. Whereas if I were at the firm, the rest of the day is gone. You've got to drive back home, get your kid, you know, you can't work remotely. So I think technology is going to be helping women and, and helping us to achieve that. Okay. We're getting more hours back in the day, right? Yeah, <laughs> that's it. There are, it's not that we're getting more hours in the day. We, we are creating the space, right? And we're reallocating the hours that are truly not necessary and making it more productive. I mean, that's what women do. Let's be honest. We are the most efficient multitaskers. Okay, uh, <laughs> let's do, do a couple of quick Q&As. I know we had a couple uh, come in. So, oh, Shannon, are you gonna lead us through the questions? Yes, um, I'll be happy to read these out. So we have a few more minutes here. We're gonna try and get through a few questions before we sign off. First of all, I just want to thank the three of you. I'm so in awe of how you do it all. And again, I'm just so grateful. Um, so really appreciate you sharing your stories. They're, they're very moving and inspirational and just want to thank all of our audience members again. You know, I'm sure that you all have your own stories and journeys too. So thank you so much for being here and thank you for sending in your questions. So um, like I said, we have a couple minutes here. First question that we have from the audience is, what advice would you give to young women who are just starting out in law and what qualities do you think are essential for success in this field? So I'll uh, answer that. So I, uh, in my advice, I wouldn't, like number one, I wouldn't compare myself to others. Uh, that is number one, because everybody progresses differently and is you know, established in different stages of their life, um, whether you know it or you don't know it. So that's one thing, like you go at your own pace and what you feel most comfortable doing. Um, if you, and the second piece of advice is if you agree to do something, do it with a hundred percent of every, everything you have, otherwise don't agree to do it because it's not worth taking the chance to do something 50% and then you look bad. Just do it well. Otherwise, don't agree to do it. The third piece of advice I have would be um, whether you want to write it down or keep it at the back of your head, always have a goal um, to plan your future because it, even if you have to stray off of that goal or that path, somehow you'll figure out how to get back onto that path. And qualities that I would, uh, just based on my personal experience, is be open-minded. That's a big one. So don't be afraid to challenge yourself and um, think outside the box if you have to, and don't be afraid to fail because it will only lead you down the correct path if you do fail. Um, always ask for help. Uh, don't be afraid to um, ask for help. And when you do get the help, always write it down so you don't have to re-ask the same exact question. <laughs> uh, and another quality, I don't know if it's, well, anyways, it's avoid being arrogant. That is to me, that is with my experience. Um, I find that 
if you're arrogant, arrogant uh, I feel like you know more seasoned lawyers or any any, any lawyers or law clerks in the field, they don't um, they don't appreciate it and they can sense it. So it's okay to have confidence and have because conf being confident has is a yeah. positive attribute and will help encourage you in the end. But being arrogant, uh, I would just try to avoid steer away from that. Thanks. That's great advice. Thank you, Sonia. Uh, it looks like that's all we have time for today. Um, I just want to thank all of our panelists again, and thank you so much to all of our audience members for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed. I know I learned a lot um, and I'm feeling very inspired. So thanks to all of you and we hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, everyone, and happy International Women's Day tomorrow.